So um, let's take each of those phrases from uh, six four on and look at them. I'm not gonna go and do a complete exegesis of it because we will never hear an end of what this means. Everyone, and this is an important thing to bring up, is that every, every exegete or expositor of Scripture starts with their own presuppositions. Uh, so you're going to be biased. And I'll be honest, I'm biased. Um, my presuppositions are the... Uh, Orthodox Church doctrinal standards and canons, the body of truth that's been passed down to us. And so I will look at the text through the lens of what the church has taught. Um, so when, when there's a difficult passage, I look at it and I say, okay, what has the church said about this? Where, where else in the scripture is this taught? And where have any church fathers spoken about this? And you seek to harmonize. Everybody does the exact same thing. Nobody can say that they approach the scripture from a neutral position. The question is, are your positions, are your presuppositions, uh, both biblical and historical? In other words, orthodox. I have no right to just come up with my own reading and say, well, you see... This Bible verse, it says this, and thank God that's what it means. And, and then I hang a shingle out and say, I'm um, Second Baptist Church. Can't do that. Um, so let's look at the phrases. It is impossible for those who are once enlightened. What does that mean? Well, again, a text without a context is a pretext. So you're not going to find all these things in Scripture. You're going to have to look historically in the life of the church because the life of the church is the context of the scripture. Enlightened ones are ones who were baptized. When somebody is getting ready for baptism, they, um, they're called catechumens. And it says, you who are preparing for baptism... For a holy illumination to part. Um, when somebody is baptized recently, they're called a neophytos, newly baptized, literally newly planted. In fact, you'll find that in Romans chapter 6. He says, For if we have been planted together, simphitamen, uh, planted together, which shows that baptism is, in a, is a planting into the life of God. It is impossible for those who are once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift. Now, again, if you didn't have the church context for this, you wouldn't know what, what in the world this is talking about. Um, this is Holy Communion. When we have concluded the divine liturgy, we sing... We have tasted the heavenly gift. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. He that comes to me shall never hunger, and he that believes on me shall never thirst. Now, if you don't like that teaching, if you say, well, that's just spiritual, we have to recognize he's not talking about his mere physical body it's his spiritual divinized body which we partake of the words that i speak unto you that which is born of the flesh is flesh that which is born of the spirit is spirit the words that i speak unto you they are spirit and, and life in john 6 when he says that about the eucharist about the manna and the will manna He's talking about his body and his blood. It's the divinized body which we partake of. And since it's divinized, we are what we eat, so we become divinized. We partake of his eternal life. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. We have tasted the heavenly gift, and we're made partakers of the Holy Ghost. 
those are really the three sacraments. You are baptized. You partake of um, the Eucharist. And you have hands laid on you. He just said that, right? He just said it in the verse before. 6.1, the foundation of repentance from dead works, baptism, laying on of hands, resurrection of the dead. Um, when we have uh, the, the presbyter lay, we, are, well, we won't go over the whole laying on of hands again. Uh, we've already done that. And I've tasted the good word of God and the powers of the word of, and the powers of the world to come. Now, literally, that's dynamis uh, ton melondon tu aionos, the the powers, dynamis of the age to come, the coming age. So, in the uh, Nicene Constantinopolitan Creed, we will say, "I believe in the resurrection of the dead and the life of the age to come." That's scripture. That is straight out of Hebrews six five. The Lord teaches. Uh, a two-age understanding of eschatology or the study of last things, the reformers as well. Protestant reformers, uh, they were deformed in their theology, but they had some good things, right? We, we have to acknowledge they were right about the Trinity and some other things. Uh, they weren't complete, completely void of truth. And so most of them understood a two-age theory of eschatology. Luther did. Uh, this world and the world to come. You'll find that in Luke chapter 20. Uh, and then in Matthew chapter 12, Jesus says, uh, Truly I say unto you, all sins shall be forgiven to the sons of men, and blasphemies wherewithsoever where they shall blaspheme. But he that shall blaspheme against the Holy Ghost hath never forgiveness, neither in this world, neither in that which is to come. Notice what he says, verse 6. And I'm going to park here for a minute. If they shall fall away to renew them again unto repentance, seeing they crucified to themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to an open shame. We have to connect this verse with the verses before it. His exhortation, the subjunctive that he uses, is in a verse 3. He is exhorting them to move on to perfection. Let us go on unto perfection. Pharometha. That is what he is encouraging to do. And why? Because if you fall away or fall to the side, you can't go and lay the foundation again. In other words, you can't go and be baptized again if you sin. There's no need to lay the foundation again. You are brought back to repentance through the plank of repentance, which is a sacrament of confession or turning your whole heart towards God. When it says falling away, that is an inaccurate translation. First of all, it's a participle, which means you can fill in whatever word you want it could be when they shall fall away. It could be since they fall away. The word if is not there. And it's also not fall away. It's fall to the side. It is parapipto is the uh, basic verbal form, which means to fall to the side. Uh, Fall away has the idea to it, but it means a failing. You, you, you fall. You stumble. It's, in fact, the noun form of this is paraptoma, is your stumblings. So it has nothing to do with um, an uh, apostasy as such. We, we commit paraptomata every day. We stumble every day. Uh, is what we do with it that matters. Uh, seeing they crucified to themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to an open shame. 
For the earth which bring, drinks in the rain that comes off upon it and brings forth herbs meet for them by whom it is dressed receives blessing of God. This is a difficult passage to understand. I would encourage you to read Mark chapter 4. Mark chapter 4 is a parable of the sower and he's, ex he's referring explicitly to that. Um, but that which bears thorns and briars is rejected and is nigh unto cursing whose end is to be burned. So you have two groups. You have the wheat and the chafe, the goats and the sheep. You have the wise virgins and the foolish virgins. You have the good ground and the bad ground in this passage. In this passage, the good ground is what brings forth fruit. And the bad ground is what brings forth a uh, thorns and thistles. The the harvest, as a result, which will be cursed. Well, he then says, "Well, we we are persuaded of better things of you." In other words, he's trying to tell them, give them encouragement. I don't believe you're in this bad ground lot. I don't believe you are goats. I don't believe you are foolish virgins. I don't believe you are tares. I don't believe that you are the reprobate. I believe that you are the elect. We are persuaded better things of you and things that accompany salvation, though we thus speak. For God, and, and the reason why he, he has an assurance for these people is because they served God. For God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love, which you have shown toward his name, and that you have ministered to the saints and do minister. So they have a record of serving God. And he's like, I'm persuaded based on your communion with the truth that you are walking in the truth. But we need to continue in it. And so he says, we desire that every one of you do show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope unto the end. That you be not slothful, but followers of them who through faith and patience inherit the promises. So here's a here's a uh, here's the exhortation. These Hebrew Christians were tempted to go, they had been justified, they had been illuminated, they had been baptized, they had partaken of the Eucharist, they had uh, known God, they had tasted the powers of the world to come, but uh, they were tempted to go back. And he says, you need to keep going on because you're not once saved, always saved. You, through faith and patience, inherit the promises. Remember, salvation, and we talked about this earlier, is is the partaking of the new and greater covenant, which our Lord and God and Savior Jesus Christ confirmed by his own blood. The promise, Hebrews 9.15, of the covenant is given officially at the second coming. Now we receive the aravona tu paravmatos tu agiu now, the pledge of the Holy Spirit now. And the Holy Spirit cries within our hearts, Abba, Father, Romans 8, 14. Galatians chapter 4, verse 6 and 7 mentions this. God sent forth the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Wherefore, we're no more children but sons, and of sons and heirs. We receive this full inheritance at the second coming. But we can also forfeit this inheritance. Abraham was... now. In order to understand this passage, we have to go back to the life of Abraham. And uh, it's going to take a little bit of explanation, but uh, I, I ask you to bear with it. Abraham pictures the Ordo Salutis, the order of salvation in Latin. Abraham was called of God in Genesis 12. Well, well, well let, me, let me go back for folks that don't know the text. We know that Romans 8, 28, 
We know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. More for whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. More for whom he did predestinate, them he also called, and whom he called, them he also justified, and whom he justified, them he also glorified. So you have calling, justification, and glorification. You have those three fulfilled in the life of Abraham in the book of Genesis. Abraham is called in Genesis chapter 12. That means that God calls him, bids him to follow him and partake of the promise. That's Genesis 12. Uh, Hebrews 11, by faith Abraham, when he should go out to receive an inheritance which, uh, to receive an inheritance which he should afterwards receive for an inheritance, a land which he should after receive for an inheritance, obeyed, and he went out not knowing whither he went. So he was called in Genesis 12. He was justified in Genesis 15. In Genesis 15, it says, Abram, Abraham believed on the Lord and it was counted to him for righteousness, Genesis 15, 6. So he was justified. That meant that he was declared to be a member of his covenant. And then in Genesis 22, he offers up his son Isaac upon the altar. God forbids him, takes it away. And then you see the ram in the thicket. And it says that uh, Abraham was justified again. But if you don't see this specifically in the text, you know, you corroborate it from the parallel passages. He had a vision of God. He was glorified according to John chapter 8. Abra Abraham received the promise at that point. He was glorified. And it says in John chapter 8, your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day. And when he saw it, he was glad. He saw the glory of God. He saw Jesus glorified and he received that promise of the glory of God and partook of that glory while he was still in the flesh. So by faith and patience, we inherit the promise. And we can uh, see that in the life of Abraham. That you be not slothful, but followers of them who through faith and patience inherit the promises. And he's going to give this to Abraham. Uh, the illustration of Abraham. For when God made promise to Abraham, because he could swear by no greater, he swear by himself, saying, Surely I will bless thee, and multiplying I will multiply thee. And so, after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. When did he obtain the promise? After he endured. He that shall endure in the end, the same shall be saved. Right? Matthew 24, 13. Hebrews 3. Uh, we are made partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. Abraham endured to the end. He offered his son Isaac, and then God gave him that promise. That's what the text says. For when God made promise to Abraham, because he could swear by no greater, he swear by himself, saying, Surely blessing I will bless thee, and multiplying I will multiply thee. When did Abraham get the promise? After he endured. He was obedient. And by the obedience of faith, God gave it to him. After he patiently endured, in other words, after he offered up Isaac, he obtained the promise. Now, that's how you explain James chapter 2. Was not our father Abraham justified by works? Yes, he was at that point. For men truly swear by the greater, and no for confirmation is to them an end of all strife, wherein God willing more abundantly to show unto the heirs of promise the immutability of his counsel confirmed it by an oath, that by two immutable things in which it was impossible for God to lie, we might have a strong consolation who fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope set before us, which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which enters into that within the veil, whether the forerunner is for us entered, even Jesus made an high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. But this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the king and blessed him, etc. We'll, we'll end with uh, six uh, there, uh, rather than uh, going on to seven. 
And uh, next episode or, or, or discussion, we'll talk a little bit more about the hope set before us, in, in other words, the Eucharist. Uh, and we can have all kinds of nasty comments in the uh, comments about how uh, it's not the Eucharist, but, but that's all right. Uh, God bless. Anyways, Hebrews chapter 6, in a nutshell, God has given us a promise. This is the promise which he hath promised us, even eternal life. 1 John 2.25 If we abide in him, we shall have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. 1 John 2.28 We have boldness in that day because we abide in him. Let us not be like the Jews of old who were tempted to draw back unto perdition and no longer accept the Lord's sacrifice as offered through the Eucharist and go back to self-righteousness, works righteousness, and go back to the Jewish system of works which could or sacrifice which could never sanctify a man. And look to the example of Abraham. Abraham, when he offered up his son Isaac, was a recipient of the promise of God. When we partake of the Eucharist, we are made partakers of the divine nature, and we receive in part that inheritance. Just like Abraham received that inheritance when he offered up Isaac upon the altar, we are, like Abraham, putting forth, showing forth the Lord Jesus Christ. Only we do it not typically, but actually. May God bless us and keep us as we prepare for his coming. Amen.